Pierce's. Body Pierce's. Okay. We'll do that some more. All right, Carl, get to uh, boot it up there. Now, last uh, time we were talking about the possibility of disease, which is a very serious possibility because of what it takes place when a person gets a tattoo. Which one of these do I want off? That? Okay, now here's why it's uh, so prone to disease and uh, really dangerous. And by the way, most tattooists would not even warn the customer of the possibility of danger there. And uh, most of them won't even acknowledge the serious health dangers involved. There's other dangers too, not quite so deadly as uh, hepatitis B and C and uh, other diseases like age and so forth, you get through that. Um, it doesn't matter how harmless the tattoo might look, but it can cause a chronic skin disorder of some type, such as sarcoid, which is a, a, a tumor. It's not uh, malignant, but it can cause a tumor to come up. Or a keloid scarring, which is a very thick scarring, and I'll show you some of those uh, later, if not tonight, next time. Cause allergic dermatitis, uh, photosensitivity, Reaction, psoriasis, and even uh, not only benign but malignant tumors as well. And a lot of people are turn out to be allergic, allergic to the ink itself, like the man you saw there, where his arm was all swollen up as a reaction to the to the ink and so forth. The pigments in tattoo ink have um, tiny bits of metal in them, iron oxide, little slivers of iron oxide, microscopic. But because of that, a uh, person with a tattoo gets an MRI, he can have an extremely burning situation where that tattoo is. And because of that, a lot of uh, medical institutions will not allow an MRI if somebody has a tattoo because of the dangers involved there. So since MRIs uh, can be very uh, effective medical test, then a uh, person ought to think about things like that before they go and get a tattoo. It might bar you from, from the doctor being able to learn what he needs to know in your situation. So, now we saw that picture last time. That machine hits the skin uh, 3,000 times a minute. That's 50 times a second a hole is being punctured in the skin. And each hole can allow blood-borne disease to get in there if the guy's needle is dirty or, or the table's unclean or whatever the case might be there. Uh, it goes into the dermis, which is the second layer of skin. You've got three layers. The middle layer is called the dermis. And each time it punctures a hole anywhere from 1 to 1 16th of an inch in diameter. And a 16th of an inch hole is sounds small, but we're talking about uh, needle punctures, and that's pretty big. And uh, in that second layer of skin in the dermis, that's where, that's where uh, the nerve endings are. That gives you a feeling. And, heat and cold and all that. That's where the hair follicles are. That's where the sweat glands are. It's full of blood vessels. And so every time that ink is injected into the dermis, uh, you take a chance on getting some kind of disease uh, from that, getting it into your bloodstream. That's why tattooing is called dermal pigmentation because it goes into that second, second layer. And every puncture, 3,000 a minute, gives the possibility of age or hepatitis B or hepatitis C or tetanus or tuberculosis or venereal disease or any of many other uh, bloodborne diseases. The average tattoo takes about 60 minutes. That's 180,000 tiny Russian roulette holes in your skin. And each one of them can be a potential for some deadly infectious disease. 
Uh, let's go to Psalm 38. Psalm 38 sounds like a deadly disease that possibly came from what we're talking about here. Of course, it can come from any kind of deadly disease. Psalm 38. <clears throat> Verse 1, Psalm 38, verse 1. The Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over my head, as a heavy burden they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken, I am roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Of course, that will fit any kind of degenerative disease, and certainly fit those that we talked about that you could get simply from getting a tattoo. Go to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. So why are we studying this? Because tattooing has become the fad of the nation. Everybody's getting them. Exodus 15 verse 26. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, the Lord said there, he said if you would hearken to his voice. All right, what did his voice say? Our key verse is Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28. It says, you're not to make any cuttings in your flesh, nor print any marks upon you. So the Lord says, you'll hearken to my voice. Do that which is right in his sight. Give ear to his commandments. Keep his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee. Go to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. Revelation 16. This is uh, deep into the great tribulation, verse 1, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Look at chapter uh, 13, back at chapter 13. So he says uh, there's going to be a, a, a noisome and grievous sore on those who have the mark of the beast. Chapter 13, verse 16. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save, that he, uh, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now we talked about this a little bit last week with the with the prevalence of tattoos on the rise, it would be a very simple matter to a person to get one more. The mark of the beast. Whether it's implanted or tattooed or whatever way they're going to do it, uh, it would be very simple for everybody to say, okay, what's one more? I'll go ahead and take it. And if I don't take it, I can't buy my groceries anyway. So if I got any sense, I will go ahead and take it. Now, he said in chapter 16 that uh, everybody had that mark would get a grievous, a noisome, and grievous sore, which will be either in the right hand, this is my right hand, in the right hand, or in the forehead where uh, the mark of the beast is placed. He said they'd have a noisome sore, which means, uh, noisome means something evil, something wicked. Uh, call it a grievous sore, that means it can cause severe pain and be malignant, cause a lot of suffering. And the very word sore has to do with ulcer. So uh, it reminds me like, remember Job with his... Uh, with his uh, sores from head to foot, and he had to scrape himself and all that stuff, and oozing sores and open wounds and all that business. And so God, one of the judgments of God on the people who take the mark of the beast is, where the mark is, is going to be this noisome and grievous sore pop up on them. And sure enough, it could be where uh, a tattoo is. I'm not saying for sure, but uh, they're going to put it on there somewhere or other. 
All right, Carl, put the next one there. Let's go to the next uh, next uh, part of the study. Yes. Uh, you're talking about <clears throat> tattoos for information. Uh, Sarah Brown, you know, she's in the nursing and everything real yeah. high up there. Yeah. She went on a uh, uh, some kind of uh, not a retreat but a convention or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the slides that they showed during one of the presentations for future information, you know, patients. <laughs> was a tattoo that and, and she said and the lady basically told the audience I know the conspiracy theorists are going to have you know a, a heart attack when they see this but this is the future and you're just going to have to get used to it mm -hmm. so. uh, in case y'all didn't hear that it's somebody from Sarah Braddock all of you know her is a nurse and went to some kind of nursing conference so and a barcode so they could scan <coughs> a barcode tattooed on the arm so they could scan instead of a and, uh, and the, the person giving the lecture said that was the future of, of a hospital. They were going to tattoo a barcode on somebody's arm instead of giving them a bracelet. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, go with the next one. No, not the next one yet. That one right there. The exposure of tattoos. What is it? It's the Bible itself. Look at Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, our key verse in this study, Leviticus chapter 19. Verse 28, 1928. You shall not, does this sound like a suggestion? No. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh from the dead, nor print any marks, not make any cuttings, not print any marks upon you, by whose authority? I am the Lord, by God's authority. Now, this verse is the Christian tattooist nightmare. Christian who has tattoos, because the Lord plainly says, very clearly, very strongly, no doubt about it, he said you're not to put any mark <coughs> on your flesh. So that verse condemns tattooing from start to finish. There's no way to get around it. You shall not make any cuttings, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. What could be more clear than that? You shall not print any marks upon you. Uh, simple, straightforward command. God said it, and that should settle it for everybody. There's no, there's no, uh, no wiggle room in that verse at all. He said you're not to do this, and there's no excuse for uh, doing it. Uh, well, mm, that's fine uh, in the past, but in today's Laodicean, godless, carnal, worldly Christians, it's becoming commonplace. And it's going to keep on becoming commonplace as more and more Christians bail out on God and His Word and figure out ways to justify their open rebellion against plain words in Scripture. And so how do they get around uh, this, Leviticus 19, 28? Well, one of the simple ways to say, well, that's the Old Testament. Right. It's not the New Testament doesn't say anything about it, which is true. It does not say one word about putting marks on you or anything like that. But that's the excuse they will use. Well, let me let me uh, throw in something. Bestiality is a sin, and it's mentioned only in the Old Testament. Two times, Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. But it is a vile, wicked sin. And what Christians today would say, well, that's in the Old Testament, so it's okay, and God won't mind. Mm -hmm. See how that thinking goes? Wicked, wicked, wicked. Right. I mean, how could a holy God now in the New Testament dispensation tolerate what he is utterly condemned back there in the Old Testament? It doesn't, doesn't change just because it's New Testament. Now, let's look at context here. That's, that creates a problem. Look at the verse immediately after that verse that's not supposed to be for today. Verse 29. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to Lordham and the land become full of wickedness. Now, how many moms and dads would say, well, that's the Old Testament. We don't have to go buy that. I mean, let's sell our daughters and make a lot of money. Who in the world would think that way? That's not mentioned in the New Testament. Amen. It's only in the Levitical law where that's mentioned. But who in the world would, uh, would think it doesn't still apply today? Same context, next verse. So uh, what the problem is, Christians 
see things in the Bible they don't like and don't agree with, and regardless of context, they will some way try to justify violating the verse they do not agree with. And one of the key ways they do that, that's under the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace. So that doesn't apply to us. And that's the reasoning on verse 28 here. Never would be on verse 29, but it is on verse 28 because only the Old Testament forbids tattoos. Same reasoning when people take it in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 22 and other passages. There's stuff they don't, don't want to hear about, don't want to adhere to. There's all kind of moral laws in the Old Testament that are not mentioned in the New Testament. But don't you, wouldn't you think that if it's a moral law, God would still uh, expect us to be moral today, whether, whether we're in the Old Testament or not? Amen. Moral laws do not change. Abominations do not change with dispensations. So, uh, uh, we'll look at the verse before it. And back, in fact, back up, uh, let me see, is this the verse I want? Well, let's back up on that. Put the next, put the next one up there, Carl. Let's see some of these arguments. Tattoos are okay, not done for the dead. Isn't that verse, what verse 28 says? Make no cuttings in your flesh for the dead. That's one of the main arguments uh, for Christians who survey this verse and justifying tattooing themselves because it's they don't do it for the dead. If it's not for the dead, then it's okay, right? Now, we, we talked about a lot of these tattoos. Aren't they centered around the dead? Remember all of them I showed you? Skulls and devils and all that kind of stuff is a vast majority, <laughs> vast majority of them. Well, whether, whether you did it for the dead or not, how could you get around a clear command that says you will not print any marks upon you? Whatever the reason might be for you doing that. No marks, not any marks, period, uh, whether it's associated with idolatry of the dead or not. Of course, that's dealing with idolatry, idolatry there. Wycliffe's Bible uh, Encyclopedia says this under the definition of tattoo and quote, while cuttings in the flesh have reference here to mourning, and where you are in, mourning customs for the dead, the tattooing does not appear to pertain to such practice. What he's saying there is that uh, in the second part of the verse, is not associated with the first part because there's a comma there. Not many make any cuttings for the dead. And oh yeah, don't be printing stuff on your body either. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, and that's not necessarily for the dead, the second part. New American Commentary on that verse says, quote, it says the warning was for cutting the body either for the dead or with tattoo marks, which says the tattoo was not for the dead. End of quote. So uh, people that use... Use those kind of arguments, that kind of argument to justify themselves. They're being dishonest with the Word of God. They are, what is the, what is the phrase in Romans chapter 1? Uh, where they misuse the scriptures and so forth. Rest. 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 Well, that's in the first period. Yes, sir? What's that mean for the dead? I don't understand. It's idolatry. It's idolatry. Uh, I saw a film years ago from a missionary from uh, some Indians in South America. And they, they um, when they bury people, they'll go back the next year and take their bones out. They pulverize their bones to powder and then put them in a long trough and pour goat's blood stuff in there on top of them, make a soup out of it, and drink it. They're doing, doing that for the, for the dead. And, and paganism, all kinds of stuff are done for the dead, okay? Uh, 1 Kings 18, the prophets of Baal are cutting themselves. That's exactly what he's talking about here for their idolatry. I don't know they if that answers you or not. Do they mean the guy getting his tattoo is not doing it for some of the dead? Is that... Well, cutting themselves for the dead is what the verse says. Yeah. All right, anyway, if you don't like some of the word of God, just cut it out and don't use it, okay? And justify yourself for not doing it. I believe uh, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Mm -hmm. Okay. All the cults practice that way. They whittle up the Bible and, and uh, uh, misinterpret it and all kind of things like that. The uh, Lord's talking about that kind of thing. Luke 16, 15, he said, You are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men, like tattoos, is abomination in the sight of God. Put the next one, Carl. Let's see another argument here. Okay, we can't uh, cut our flesh, and we can't put marks on it. We can't cut our hair either. 
uh, that's one of the silliest and stupidest arguments I've ever heard, but uh, some people use that to justify tattoos. Now, let's uh, again get back in this verse and look at the context and see where they're getting at. Look at verse 27. You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Well, let's get the whole context. Verse 26. You shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantments, nor observe times. You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. All of that has to do with idolatry. Every, every phrase in there is very clear. It's a condemnation of paganism, of witchcraft, of heathen practices. Verse 26 says, don't use enchantments. That's casting spells. That's witchcraft. Nor observe times. That's astrology. Uh, get your uh, future from the stars and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's just as pagan as it can get. Verse 28 is part of the same thing. Dealing with demonic practices. Uh, cutting the flesh. Bloodletting. We talked about that before. Tattooing markings on your flesh. All that. Why would God stick a verse in between... In between uh, 26 and 29, uh, 26 and 28, uh, about uh, about your hair and your beard, if all he's talking about there is don't go to the barbershop and get a haircut. We're in the middle of a context of paganism, Amen. heathenism, idolatry, pagan practices. He, should, he says you shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. The condemnation there was forbidding Israel to uh, get into a pagan practice that was common with the paganist, uh, pagan uh, heathen around them and cutting their hair in a certain way involved in the worship of the sun. Put the next one there. That's a drawing of two monks. And you see what they've done to their head? They'll either shave a round spot here, or they'll wear a beanie without the little helicopter thing on top of it. <laughs> um, and that's called a tongue shirt. And it represents, quote, the orb of the sun. It's involved with Baal worship, uh, the worship of the sun, uh, and so forth. And, it, and, it, and it's done with a, a circular ball spot in the back of the head. By the way, Martin Luther had that. He was a Catholic monk before he got saved. You say, well, that's not paganism and heathenism. That's Catholicism. Difference? No. Same thing. They just carried over from, from uh, Babylon and all that business. Okay, so I uh, said that's called a tonsure. Herodotus, who is a, was a Greek uh, historian in the 5th century B.C., he said the use of that type of haircut, a tonsure, forming a tonsure, was practiced by pagan religious cults in honor of one of their gods. And one of their gods, uh, it's always the sun god, depending on the culture, Ra or Zeus or whoever, uh, in the major one in each, each uh, pagan society represented the sun. All right, uh, let's put, a, put the next one on. Ain't that a beauty? He has 10 visible piercing on one side. He has a nose hole. I showed you one last time. See that hole? Let me see here. I can show you that. <laughs> that, sir, is an it. So, man, see his tonsure? That's the only air on him is that circular thing. Uh, tribal markings all over him. We saw some of those before. That was his earlobe here. Guy's a mess. <clears throat> Does he look happy? Mm. Mm. Extremely. What do you suppose he'd do if he got saved? What a mess. Now, uh, it's not up there, but that picture had a caption underneath it. Here's what it said, quote, Conspicuous tattoos and other body modifications can make gainful employment difficult in many fields. In a quote. Not the only place he could get a job, being a tattoo parlor. Let's see the next guy. 
His head is partially shaved. His eyebrows are gone and they're tattooed on now. He has six, six uh, piercings in his face and the large earring thing there. Uh, does he look happy? Mm. You know when these characters are happy? When they're out boozing it up somewhere, getting drunk, partying with their friends and all that kind of stuff as a moment of relief. And when that moment's over, they're back in their miserable condition. <coughs> yes. He does. He does. Yeah, he had no eyebrows. I, I, did, I meant to point that out. But he had, uh, what do they call that? No, he had implants here. Bumps. Yeah, typically they're metal, metal or ceramic of some sort. Yeah. Can you go back one? Yeah. Right there. See, his eyebrows have been removed and he's got... Uh, Something implanted in there. I showed you some of those before. Horns and stuff are implanted. Yeah. It's also tied into it. it is. It is. All, all the stuff goes together. Uh, okay, go back. Go back uh, one more. All right, now, in just a minute, I'm going to show you this guy again. And you're going to see how handsome he looks with all this gear. Go ahead. See that there? Oh. Without the disc in it? And you girls want to put a disc in your ear ring? In your ear? Mm. His eyebrows are gone, tattooed on, half shaved up here. Got this to his mouth and all this other stuff on there. What a mess. Mm. What a mess. He still doesn't look happy, does he? Hey. Mm. <clears throat> all right, let that one sit for a while, Carl. Um, up until just a few years ago, anybody professing to be a Christian, even the most liberal, would not get a tattoo and would condemn tattoos and so forth. But now they're so commonplace that everybody wants one, especially kids coming up. You know, they want to get in on it and so forth. And yet it's always been condemned in history, and condemned in the Bible. And every historical resource ever written on tattoos confirms that fact. You remember how many quotes I gave you from toe tattoo books? Mm -hmm. I all think the same way. From uh, the, the Body Art Book, a complete illustrated guide to tattoos, piercings, and other body modifications, quote, just as occurred in other cultures with tattoo traditions when these pagan tribes working for, no set. Now this is a pro-tattoo book talking about the stuff coming from pagan tribes. When these pagan tribes were converted to the Christian religion, their spiritual and cultural rights, which included tattooing, piercing, and scarification, were outlawed. End of quote. What that book says is anywhere Christianity showed up in the pagan societies that uh, all this stuff ceased. In the book Tattoo History, a source book, quote, whenever missionaries encountered tattooing, they eradicated it. End of quote. Well, I doubt they will anymore. Another quote. While these and other body modifications continue to be practiced underground, that means after the missionaries got there and Christianity outlawed and all that, continue to be practiced underground as a way for non-Christian people to identify each other, God forbid you got caught and your mark was revealed, end of quote. You had a lot of trouble. Uh, up until a few years ago, every Christian commentary, without exception as far as I know, and I've you know, read scores and scores of them, I've got dozens of them at the house, all the way back from the church fathers, third and fourth centuries and all that. Every one of them, without exception, on Leviticus of 1928, condemned tattooing on the basis of that verse. And um, so much it said Christians shouldn't even consider having a tattoo. Jameson Fawcett and Ram commentary on this verse, Leviticus 1928, quote, Nor print any marks upon you by tattooing. Imprinting figures of flowers, leaves, stars, and other fanciful devices on various parts of their person. The impression was made sometimes by means of hot iron, sometimes by ink or paint, as is done by the Arab females of the present day and the, and the uh, different caste of the Hindus. A strong propensity, that means uh, inclination, a strong propensity to adopt such marks in honor of some idol 
gave occasion to the prohibition in this verse. And they were wisely forbidden, for they are they were signs of apostasy. And once made, they were insuperable, unable to change, uh, insuperable obstacles to a return. In quote. So the commentaries, James the Father Brand back, back about 1850. New manners and customs of the Bible. Quote on this verse. Tattooing forbidden. Both cutting and tattooing were done by the heathens, and so God forbade his people from doing so in imitation of them. In a quote. Kaufman's commentary on Leviticus 19, 28, uh, 19 verse 28, quote. The cutting of one's flesh also characterized pagan worship as attested by the priest of Baal on Mount Carmel in the contest with Elijah. That's uh, 1 Kings 18. Tattooing was also a device of paganism. Christians generally disapprove of tattooing despite the fact of the widespread use of it by many even today. In the light of what God says here, Leviticus, and in view of the history of it, it seems strange that anyone would pay someone else to tattoo him. End quote. No, kind of strange. Um, Erdman's uh, commentary on Leviticus on this verse, quote, the custom of tattooing was forbidden while among all the nations of antiquity it was common, end quote. All the nations of antiquity were pagan nations. The only nation where God was involved in antiquity is Israel. Nave's topical Bible under tattooing says, just real blunt, quote, tattooing forbidden, Leviticus 19, 28, end quote. Let's see the next argument, Carl. Okay. Yes, sir. This is the now, the lost people is condemned tattoos, right? Oh, I don't know. I mean, as a world, as these guys that go tattoo books. I mean, well, it, back when I was a kid, if you saw anybody with tattoos, he's probably a sailor. Yeah. Well, I mean, hardly it, anybody else ever had. It wasn't popular for everybody. No. But now, it's popular for Christian people who used to, when considered, that shows me, the generation of, of our whole people. Man, how they degenerated into the Well, absolutely. What does the Bible call this time frame? They ought to see it. Right, some people. Argument number three. What then about Isaiah 44 5 and Ezekiel 9 verse 4? A few uh, Christian tattooers claim these verses as examples of God ordained tattoos. Let's put the next one up there. Isaiah 44. Hold it, hold this one. Turn to it. I want you to see it with your eyes. Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44, verse 5. Go ahead and put that on. One shall say, I am the Lord's. And another shall call himself by the name, name of Jacob. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. Uh, subscribe means to show consent to something by signing your name to it, like you would sign a, a document or something like that. Now, the context here, chapter 44, verses 1 to 4, God is promising to bless Israel. And the prophecy in verse 5 is in response to those blessings and simply says the Jews will agree to those blessings. And of course, that deals with the kingdom and so forth. The verse, notice the verse says, subscribe with, not subscribe on. But that's one of the verses they'll use to say, okay, God approves tattoos. Uh, there he's letting somebody subscribe with his hand, not on his hand, but with his hand. Uh, one of the Jewish commentaries on these two verses, it says this on chapter 44, verse 5, it says, quote, this verse is not talking about tattoos. Well, okay. It goes on, what he is saying is, and he will write with his hand to the Lord, like someone who signs a contract to express his utmost commitment and obligation, end quote. By the way, that, uh, what I just quoted was written by Rabbi David of Ben Solomon in 1573. We're going back there. All right, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 9, turn there. Ezekiel chapter 9. So that verse doesn't hold any water as far as what we want to say about it. Ezekiel 9. Okay. Put it up there. Look at it in the Bible. Verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, 
through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations done in the midst thereof. Uh, that Jewish commentary says on that verse, quote, Ezekiel 9.4 uses the word tav, Hebrew, which means a mark or a sign. The man clothed with linen, that's in verse, uh, the context here, going back to verse 2, the man clothed with linen is going to mark the foreheads of the righteous with ink, not tattoo them. Someone who read, who read the verses in the Hebrew uh, original would never dream that they're referring to tattoos. Well, I didn't read it in the Hebrew, I read it in the English, and I didn't dream it had anything to do with tattoos either. Can you see tattoos in that verse? No. He's putting a mark on their forehead for what? Revelation chapter 7. God's going to mark 44,000 witnesses. Y'all remember all that? Now back here's a historical situation where he's about to destroy Jerusalem under the Babylonians and he's marking those that are that are right to God in the city so they don't get uh, destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. All right, let's uh, look at another argument. What about that? But Jesus was tattooed. What? Look at Revelation 19. Let's see what they're talking about. Some Christian tattooers will go that far and claim that the Lord has a tattoo. They say when he returns, in Revelation 19 on a horse, he's going to have a tattoo on his thigh. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. No question, that's the Lord Jesus. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written, but no man knew, uh, that no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, <clears throat> clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So, verse 12 says he has a name written, uh, that nobody knows but he himself. Verse 16, he hath on his vesture on his thigh name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lords. Now, can anybody believe Christians are that stupid to think that justifies tattoos? That is insane. Let me quote you what a Christian said, a professing Christian. His name is Larry Overton. He's with Berean Bible Study. Quote, and what of Christ himself? Twice in chapter 19 our Lord is depicted as having a name written on him, verses 12 and 16. As unthinkable as it may be for some to picture our Lord Jesus as having a tattoo, the author of the apocalypse had no problem with it, end of quote. Now, the problem with that guy, he's Church of Christ, so he's not even saved. And notice he used the word apocalypse instead of revelation. Apocalypse is not a word Christians use. That's a word Hollywood uses. And it's not a word found in the Bible. But the word revelation is in there several times. 2 Peter 3.16, they that are unlearned and unstable rest the scriptures unto their own destruction. And look at the verse 16. It says, uh, he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. Okay? Is it possible? Is it possible that the name is on the vesture which Amen. is laying on his thigh? Is that a possibility? Amen. I'll guarantee you one thing when the Lord comes back, you ain't going to see his thigh. Amen. Amen. That's condemned in Isaiah 47. Amen. So, this has nothing to do with tattoos. Hey. You'll see there also there's a comma. Uh, there's no comma between vesture and thigh, which ties them together. So, I don't think anybody with any spiritual sense at all, with any half of brain would uh, really believe Jesus Christ has a tattoo. I'm telling you, the, the length professing Christians will go to condemn the Word of God. Amen. Private interpretation. Now, if Jesus has a tattoo, or ever gets a tattoo, 
It would be a direct violation of Leviticus 19, verse 26. Amen. If he's in direct violation of a command in that book, he's a sinner. If he's a sinner, you are not saved. If you're not saved, you're going to hell. It requires a sinless substitute Amen. to pay for our sins. Amen. And the Lord never violated any scripture, never disobeyed any of the commands Amen. he said. He said he's always done what his father said. Amen. 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 Sir. He said he cannot deny himself. Uh, he said that. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. The Lord was without sin and therefore without tattoos. Amen. You've got to be spiritually perverted to think he has a tattoo. Amen. First James 1, I mean 1 Peter 1 verse 18. There's no first James anyway. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. No blemish, no spot. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 15. For we have not a high priest, that's Jesus, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, next three words, yeah. yet without sin. Hey. No sin. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 21. For he, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us who do no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's clear from that verse. He had no sin at all. In order to be a sin sacrifice, the Father had to make him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The sin of every Christian tattooist on the planet was placed on Jesus, on Calvary. They are the sinners, not the Lord. 1 John 3, verses 4 and 5, Whoso committeth, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he, Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Amen. Not a bit. Mm. Well, I think I'll quit there for the night. Any, any questions, comments? Yes, sir. Even the ignoring the fact that Jesus was, was without sin when he died for us. When he comes back in the tribulation, will he not be in his glorified body? Absolutely. Which is incapable of sin? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comments? We have a high priest, which we can touch with our infirmities. Maybe. Because he was tempted in all points like we are, but he didn't yield any of them. Amen. Glory to King Jesus. All right. Any other comments? Okay, we'll quit there for tonight and pick up on that a little bit next time. Okay. We will take a little bit of time here for some prayer.